hello, uh, my name is Rosa Rogina. I uh, work as um, head of program at London Festival of Architecture, which is a month long event uh, taking place across London annually. Uh, we are super excited um, to be working around the theme of care this year, which obviously uh, will be uh, incorporated and discussed uh, in this talk as well. And um, in my secondary role, I also teach architecture at University of East London at master level. So I'm very excited to be here today. My name's Isaac Sallows. I'm a third year architecture student. Uh, our projects are based in London, in Farringdon, and we're redeveloping the old Blitz sites from the World War II and um, looking to sort of uh, republicize the areas within. So yeah, that's that's me. Hello, uh, my name is Munira Tutaure and I'm studying, I'm in year five with uh, Maria and Carlo. Our project this year is based in Italy, in Santo Pietro. I'm also working as a part-time uh, at uh, Jealous Architects. That's a really great question and a very challenging one uh, for architects across the planet. I guess in many ways um, it, uh, the change could be uh, directly through architecture. So how can we create environments that are more sustainable and more caring to, the, to its final users and uh, passers-by? Uh, but also thinking about the, the, the construction process and how architects can uh, more sustainably uh, tackle the crisis through use of material, local resourcing, um, you know, the ways how um, in, uh, yeah, in different forms we can kind of uh, reduce uh, use of carbon uh, across the planet. And then I guess the kind of longer term ambition should be how can we impact beha behavioral change of people so how can we through our designs and um, things that we implement um, in public realm or even in private spaces um, uh, kind of trigger that uh, additional thinking and awareness of people to be more enver uh, environmentally minded both in terms of using those spaces but in also in their wider beha behavior across the planet i'd like to bring up what you said about repairing the planet and uh, bring up a bit of a story from last year so Part of our year two project was we were able to visit Thessaloniki, which is in North Greece. And the, the whole ethos of the project was sort of rewilding the site as well as rehoming the refugees in North Thessaloniki. So where we have this idea of becoming sort of harmonious with nature, it's also repairing the community as well. And I feel like that can go quite far in terms of sort of healing and helping the planet, not just through buildings, material and nature, but through the people and like the socio-economic sort of changes. So I feel like that's quite a big part of the architecture that we do as well. It's not just the materials and what we use, it's how we can sort of integrate the people that we use them, because at the end of the day, that is almost the most important thing. Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, Rosa and uh, Isaac. I think it's about striving for a carbon neutral solution, creating more than is removed, and uh, using the latest technology to achieve efficiency in design and architecture as well. Yeah, I think we are on, all on the same page in seeing role of an architect not just as a kind of building provider, but more being a social agent. Um, that uh, alongside delivering great uh, buildings, whether they're temporary or permanent, it's also about thinking the kind of wider role in society, going back to that idea of uh, changing the behavior of, of people, uh, which I think is really crucial in our discipline. I think there's also this element of like um, the appreciating. And if you're able to have and live sort of this green lifestyle, you're able to then appreciate the greener aspects of architecture. So it all runs together sort of harmoniously in that respect. With sort of my thesis project at the moment is this idea of taking this material that was shoveled away during the war. And although maybe I might not be coming from a sort of practitioner sort of side of it, because it's still very sort of the way of the education, but it's this idea of working out our sort of cubic feet of material and lowering that sort of carbon footprint for the site. There's no need for us to be able to go the easy route and say every column is concrete when we've got the material here and there that we can sort of keep that far away, especially in an area like London, where if we can keep the material that's already in London in London, we're not exporting inwards and that sort of it's that whole idea of lowering these emissions and the carbon footprint, which obviously in today's world is extremely important.
Absolutely. I think that there is something really interesting about not just seeing a role of, a, of an architect in constructing new things, but it's also kind of factoring in uh, like the processes of also buildings going down. And what does that mean? And how do we use that resource? Can we use it? And uh, yeah, where we can kind of repurpose it uh, mm -hmm. going forward, which I think you're kind of hinting, Isaac, is kind of a thematic of your project to a certain extent as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And as for me, as my project is based in a village in Santo Pietro, and uh, I really wanted to achieve as much as carbon neutral in my building, I decided to use ram earth. And now I am doing investigation to be able to have my walls. <laughs> they will be very thick, but they will not need to have any insulation. And I'm doing actual searches to have a roof. I'm not sure I will have a roof that will not need insulation, but this is what I'm working on to save the environment. But because I really think that it's a setup of mine, even if it's a project class, you really have to uh, feel it. And yeah, that's where I'm starting now. Brilliant. That's, that's really exciting. And I guess that kind of brings back the idea that we should all be learning from different parts of the world as well and yeah. like different histories and legacies and you know people have been working with rand earth and a reuse of materials historically and currently in many kind of uh, places um, across the globe yeah there are many places we should be learning from absolutely there's not just one way of doing architecture i think the beauty of architecture is it's this sort of infinite possibilities of what you can sort of appreciate with your nature and the environment that you've been given so yeah, it's very, very exciting in that respect. I guess one of the things, especially in my role at London Festival of Architecture, which is very public facing and lots of our work is kind of situated directly in public realm and touches people who on one hand are interested in architecture, but maybe some of them, you know, uh, are not. But uh, we try to engage them uh, with matters of yeah, uh, built environment, sustainability in a creative way. And fundamental part of that process, especially post COVID, is rethinking how do people meet? And how can we accommodate uh, various different scenarios and formats for people to meet in a safe um, and comfortable way, which going forward will, of course, have massive impact on uh, not just public spaces, but also like office spaces and all sorts of other kind of locations where masses of people are supposed to come in and, and kind of be in the same environment um, in the same time. So I guess also our profession is changing with COVID um, and we, we need to be on the forefront of that thinking. I don't think we should be just reacting to it, but we should be almost inventing new ways. We want people to kind of, to come together in an environment that obviously the pandemic hopefully will pass at some point, but I don't think things will ever be the same. So it's just kind of taking that under our head and being responsible of creating that new post-COVID reality. Yeah, definitely. I think further on to that, like away from a practitioner's point, but into more education, it's quite funny that we assume it's very disconnected when we might be disconnected in person, but we're very lucky in the sort of world we live now, the way that we can connect through things like Teams, through discussions on phones, through messages. So in that respect, I'm almost more connected this year than I've probably ever been. The, the the accessibility, the fact that we've got students in our unit that, are, that might be in Cornwall, it might be abroad, and yet we're all together every week, two, three times a week. And I find that almost quite groundbreaking to an extent where this will, the last year or so, will change the way that the, the world works as such, but definitely practices and architecture. But obviously it becomes extremely difficult when you start to talk about sort of site visits and, and enabling proper in, in person discussions. So I think that's something that we'll, we'll sort of look to develop as well. But yeah, very interesting. Yeah, uh, being locked alone in my house during the coronavirus made me understood better the, like, uh, the importance of designing a space and a space living in this space. So designing it in a way that even if you are locked there for 10 years, 20 years is crucial now for me. Isaac said like we are all connected from all around the world. So I feel like uh, mainly in the housing and building housing, you have to design everything in the way that you yourself will be at ease. So 
or your clients will be very happy to be living there because as Rosa said, I'm sure that everything will change now with co after coronavirus. People will less visit each other and what, sort of things like that. So the design has really to respond to the local people if it's a big area or to the person or to the client, that is it. And again, for the public spaces, we have to think about when whenever we are designing it, we have to think for many, many years and um, I have some kind of prevention in case another coronavirus comes or another type of virus comes again so that we will not be stressed or this metal gap, for instance, can be easily um, seen in the design without modifying everything. It's a kind of having all in one at the same time. I think that's a really good point. And I guess it kind of links as well in terms of our role. How can we design spaces that are responsive and changeable even in the future? So if say another pandemic uh, happens or some event of a completely different nature comes along, how we can adapt our living environments to kind of accommodate um, those situations. Because yeah, as you said, last year, my relatively small house was both uh, my house, my office, uh, but actually also like my public space because mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to uh, be so much outdoors. So it's just thinking about if somebody can redesign that house now, how can it accommodate different scenarios that might occur in the future mm -hmm. in a sustainable way as well? I don't think everybody is aware that actually more than 40% of a world's car carbon footprint is coming from the construction industry in the first place. Um, so just in a way, almost teaching and upskilling people of what does it mean to build a new, uh, completely new uh, building of glass uh, uh, versus uh, re refurbishing an existing one. But then it's also about creating environments that are caring and appropriate and inviting for all different communities and, and people that might be using it. So not just thinking about the profile of people that perhaps we are, but also thinking about other communities that might be um, kind of using public space in a completely different way. So thinking about not just disabilities, which of course are on the forefront and should be incorporated, but there are also like various different levels and complexities of different kind of users and uses of space that we should be accommodating uh, when thinking about our design. I think it also comes down to sort of the element of the appreciativeness. If you if you're appreciating the space that you're um, using day to day, like we say that we're sort of stuck in our rooms, we're now learning to appreciate what's what our day to day space is. It sort of pushes away from the idea of like demolishing and rebuilding this perfect space, because at the end of the day, there is no idea of a perfect space. It's whatever is perfect for the person. So I think it comes back down to this sort of appreciating. And if you're able to appreciate and the longevity of that site then can work forward into the future and then that entitles then a lower carbon footprint. So it's it's all of these different sort of stages of of understanding where you are and what you're doing that can help out the planet in total in the future. I'm just coming back again to what I said for the COVID-19 answer, <laughs> which is basically the same, like why we are designing now, we have to think about the future generations to come, how will they use it in case of coronavirus, how will they use it by uh, following the development of the technology, not just design for today, but design like with the way that the technology is evolving, people are changing, using all of these factors to make great design for them so that uh, our children to come will be still happy to be working in these buildings that we will build or living in these kind of spaces. Yeah, and I think it's quite, quite interesting how both of you are referring to, to users, but not just immediate users, but also users of uh, future generations. And I guess like one key thing is to think about is that in the kind of lifespan of a building, um, architect is actually involved in quite a short fragment of the kind of the, the process. And it's also thinking about kind of uh, feeling, um, uh, making sure that people who, who end up using that space are empowered and feel ownership over it because it, it will be up to them to kind of maintain uh, that, that space and kind of evolve it in the future. So it's also about 
architects were working really closely with those end users and communities and almost like handing over that care of the end product, whether it's a house or it's a public space, you know, square or wh whatever it might be um, to those people who will essentially take it forward when we are out of the project. Definitely. And I think the proof for that is that Lakaton and Vassal won a Pritzker Prize this year. And I think it was the very first kind of um, uh, practice that won that was uh, that their kind of scope of work is not all about uh, building new kind of fleshy buildings, but it's, it's very much based on the idea of refurbishing existing ones and how through like a minimal change or like even just like adding something new to the existing fabric, you can almost transform it to something that seemingly looks like a completely uh, new intervention, but is building on the existing um, building and materials and resources that are in place. So I think definitely the, 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 the profession is very slowly, but hopefully safely shifting in that uh, direction of being more aware of what is already out there and how with minimal impact to the environment, we, we can make our um, living spaces a better place to be. I think there's there's this sort of level of sort of attractiveness if you if you reconstitute material and if you're using already a pre-made space or or using elements of that space that don't need to be demolished and if you can use that it almost has like this this historical factoring that makes a building not just a building it becomes then almost an artifact at the same time so quite similarly to like my project at the moment on Saffron Hill in Farringdon, there's this lovely nearly 30 meter long um, wall, uh, quite torn down slightly, but big brick wall that sits along the front with a big shuttering. And the aim for me was to sort of replace the shuttering, but to keep the sort of premise of this wall as this main part of this facade, as it acts as like this main entrance into this new space of a gallery. So you're 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 trying to sort of reconstitute the history of the site without making it look like you're copy and pasting a generic London building straight into a site. So I think there's that, like I said, the element of like attractiveness. People are more interested in things that don't look like they've come straight from a computer. They've got the history, the sort of ex like these exciting sort of values of this site that have gone through the history. It's not to do with us as such because we constitute such a small uh, period of time between us and the building's longevity so it's for us to make sure that not just us appreciate it but the generations after appreciate it as well or even the generations before as well that's very important I don't know, uh, I'm just thinking as well to kind of answer that question from the festival perspective which uh, in its nature is temporary so thinking about, um, you know, um, kind of building in resource and material into something that kind of comes and goes away and how um, sustainability can be tackled in that regard as well. So lots of our work is um, commissioning um, different public realm interventions across the city. And we normally uh, run it as design competitions for young architects to um, construct and get that uh, wonderful opportunity to um, act uh, in the city. And something that we are trying really hard is already at the brief stage for something that will end up being relatively temporary in its nature is um, to build in um, almost like an uh, after project plan. So whatever is constructed for the duration of, uh, of the festival, it's really important for us that it doesn't go to waste and that it's repurposed uh, either in its existing form somewhere else. So for example, for projects that are small scale, such as series of benches we do every year, we make sure that already early in the project, we work with a series of uh, local schools that uh, after being on display in public realm, those, uh, they, they can be permanently kind of honed uh, in an uh, educational environment or in the instance of uh, some larger projects such as Dalish Picture Gallery Pavilion, we have been commissioning biannually with Dalish Picture Gallery. It's thinking about how we can use that structure elsewhere. So the last pavilion designed by Yinka Ilorian Price Gore Architects, uh, which was a very wonderful, um, a colorful installation on lawns of the Dalich Picture Gallery, was then taken down and repurposed as a series of um, kits for uh, schools to build planters uh, out of that uh, 
material that was actually con uh, kind of uh, making the pavilion happen. So it, it's also thinking about if we cannot take that pavilion in its whole entirety to a different place for permanent use, how we can repurpose it in a completely different uh, life uh, somewhere else. So at the moment, the, yeah, the pavilion uh, is kind of uh, existing in uh, almost 100 different locations in uh, uh, small planters that was part of educational program for those uh, schools as well. So I think that's really important, especially on a temporary basis. If we do build something that, you know, is almost like a statement in the city, how, how we can go beyond that, that it just kind of goes down uh, and goes to waste, but uh, can it be meaningfully uh, used somewhere else in a completely different form? Reviving a, an old building, for instance, or copying or trying to inspire ourselves from local already built thing to build our new buildings are quite a good thing. But I have a question. If, for instance, the building have been designed like more than 100 years ago and we want to use like, uh, we want the building to evolve, I'm sometimes wondering if architecture in some point is evolving in this kind of places. For instance, as I am doing my project in the village, there is a kind of um, technology or a kind of material of a kind of design that I don't have to bring there because it is a village. So is the village still going to remain a village for a long, long time? Or is there a kind of barrier for its development? Or At the moment, like, we as architects are trained to think about construction and whereas mm -hmm. perhaps 20 years ago our role was you know to be kind of hidden in the office and like design the building and then at some point the building goes up um, uh, now it's kind of becoming a bit more longer and complex process where uh, in some instances communities are involved in that construction process there is lots of like self-built and uh, ideas that the process should be like socially engaging but i would say not to the same extent we are thinking about the demolition demolition is something that kind of at the moment in my opinion happens in one go and we don't really think about how can we you know um, take advantage of that process can it be expanded can we somehow as architects you know, being, be kind of involved actively in that process and perhaps, yeah, work with those communities in some meaningful way, not to just kind of simply take the building down and forget about it and build a new one, but whether there are like similar, more complex processes uh, of getting from an old building to something completely new on that site. And that, to to certain extent, be could be refurbishing the building, but it can also be a little bit about uh, like, your work, Isaac, thinking about those kind of uh, off-site materials and, you know, things, how, how we can embed that and make it much more visible than simply, you know, knocking the building down and kind of continuing as if the building was never there. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it also, it's very easy for us to say, oh, we've reconstituted the materials, but it's much better to show it, if you know what I mean. There's that if it's easy for it to say, oh, the foundations are made out of the aggregate of the building that was there before, but it's very difficult to see that. So if you've got these elements, these historical factors that can sort of sit on the site as if they're almost exhibited within themselves, it becomes very sort of special to the site. And I think that's something that sort of architects can maybe look to sort of like develop that even further. And I guess, I mean, fundamentally, buildings change and uh, pe how people use buildings and built environment changes and I think we as a profession need to kind of own that process and we need to be almost like on top of it and involved and kind of taking advantage of what can be done uh, to kind of minimize carbon footprint but also um, to kind of keep some ongoing legacies uh, and transform them in, in something new. And I guess as well, as we were saying in the design itself, allo allowing that change down the line in a way how we design buildings at the moment is really, really important. The question really reminds me of a really interesting study White, white Architecture um, Studio did um, a while ago now, which was in researching how uh, different uh, young children and youth use playgrounds. And uh, basically, if I remember correctly, the study was 
all about that children up to, I think it was age of two, but uh, don't quote me on that, uh, both female and male um, children use playground in a very similar way. And then as they grow up, um, the, the, the boys stay in the kind of center of the playground and uh, girls um, somehow retract from it and are more on the perimeter of the playground. So there are definitely some behavioral changes and um, different ways how different genders, but probably not just genders, but also, you know, like uh, uh, different kind of ethnic backgrounds use playgrounds uh, across the city. And I think for, for us as architects, it shouldn't be just about kind of placing the playing equipment uh, in kind of right position and designing it to perfection, but it's also understanding th those behaviors and kind of almost like designing something that is meaningful for all sorts of subgroups uh, that might use that space um, across its life. I think it comes back to what I've been saying the whole way through like the conversation, this like level of appreciating. Once we went into COVID, we became almost very bored within ourselves. So we were quite happy to explore. And on a day to day, especially around London, with everyone with their sort of heads in their phones, going from meeting to meeting, quickly going down to grab lunch, or if you're on the tube on your way home, you don't get to appreciate these sort of spaces, what they were originally designed for. And I think that's almost a shame that it's only being realised now. But I think we use this now to be able to sort of show in the future that these spaces sort of can be appreciated and they can be used if you're made aware of them. So I think it's sort of it's quite fun. It's quite nice. The fact that these playgrounds are now getting the element of uh, excitability back. People are quite happy to take their kids to the park again because they know that there's there's been a care and a thoughtful process gone into these parks. This whole element as well of the materialization of the parks and you don't want these big sort of rubber basings and these big metal frames. And it sort of comes back to what we were talking about earlier about the sort of reconstituting of materials and making sure everything's very sustainable. So I think with as architects, it's almost our responsibility to sort of push forward these plans, but it's the it's the people in the public that need to then learn to sort of appreciate these spaces entirely. And I think that's something due to COVID that everybody's getting much more on board with now, which is, I think, very, very exciting. I think, Isaac, what you, you, what you said was really interesting about people appreciating those spaces in COVID. And I think what it also made kind of evident is that we don't stop playing as we grow up mm -hmm. and we should be we should be thinking about what does play mean obviously in different kind of ways across all age groups so how can these spaces not just cater you know very young children but also be relevant let's say in the afternoon for elderly or for young mothers or so just thinking about expanding that accessibility to um, all different age groups that might be using space in a completely unexpected and innovative ways across days and weeks.